So welcome to CAMVAX's webinar series. Uh, this series began in October last year, and due to popular demand, we will continue to host the webinars throughout this year. The goal of these webinars is to support and inform the work of public health professionals to improve vaccine acceptance and uptake. To learn more about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website at the link you see on the screen, canvax.ca slash canvax webinar series. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the Canadian Public Health Association's office is situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. They have been the guardians of this land for millennia and CPHA is grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and their governments in realizing meaningful truth and reconciliation. We will also like to express our deepest gratitude to all the frontline essential workers dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all for your hard work in keeping us safe during this time. Today's webinar, Introducing the CARD System, Playing Your Best Hand to Improve Vaccine Delivery at School, it's brought to you by the Canadian Public Health Association through the CANVAX project and its partners, Immunize Canada, the IWK Health Centre, and the Institut National de Santé Publique de Québec. I'm Rutien Xu, CANVAX project officer with CPHA, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. My fellow project officer, Antonella Pucci, will also be helping me out on this webinar. As for a bit of housekeeping, all attendees are muted. The toolbar located on the bottom of your screen offers you a few interactive features. For this webinar, the Q&A feature will be used to ask questions. For all questions, please send them through the Q&A box. You can do so at any point during the webinar. Only you, myself, and the presenter can see your questions in the My Questions section. And you also have the option of submitting them anonymously. When asking a question to the presenter, the question will be read out loud, answered live by the presenter, and then posted in the all questions section. So feel free to submit your questions at any point. All questions will be answered in sequence at the end of the presentation. For questions regarding technical difficulties, please also ask them in the Q&A box and we will reply to you directly. If multiple people are experiencing the same problem, we will address it live. We strongly encourage attendee participation, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions on today's presentation. Finally, here are some quick notes before we start. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website at canvax.ca on the webinar page, and also on the CPHA's YouTube channel a few days after the end of this presentation. Please note that after the end of this webinar, you will be invited to take a short five minute survey. The survey lets us know your satisfaction with the webinar series, and we strongly encourage you to take this opportunity to let us know what other topics we should explore on future webinars. We take all suggestions into consideration, so please take the time to fill out the survey. Further, if you haven't already registered with CANVAX or subscribed to our newsletter, visit CANVAX today to do so. For those of you who may not be aware, we have also recently added a new COVID-19 resource page on how to maintain immunizations during this time. Please have a look. So with that, let's begin. I would like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Anna Taddeo. Dr. Taddeo is a professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto and senior associate scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children. Her program of research includes the short-term and long-term effects of pain in children, the effectiveness and safety of pain management in interventions, and evidence-based practice and implementation research. Dr. Tadio currently leads a national interdisciplinary team, Help Eliminate Pain in Kids, shortened as Help in Kids, investigating and promoting evidence-based pain management during vaccination. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Tadio. Wonderful. So thank you for that introduction, Rutian. Um, I want to begin by thanking you and everyone at CANVAX for the opportunity to present today. And I want to also shout out a thank you to everyone on the webinar for their work to promote good health in general all the time. And in particular, as you said, during this time of the pandemic. I hope that everyone and their families stay safe. 
So what I'm going to do over the next about 40 or 45 minutes is talk about the CARD system, which is a novel framework for vaccine delivery to improve the vaccination experience. And it was originally designed to assist with max vaccinations, such as vaccinations at school, but as you'll see by the end of the presentation, can actually be applied to other vaccination contexts. I'd like to acknowledge that funding for this work was obtained from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, or CIHR. Our research follows CIHR's framework of knowledge translation, shown here on this slide, and that is the movement of research evidence into action. And I'm pretty sure that this model is familiar with most of the people on the webinar. Uh, and in this model, knowledge is in the middle here, which is uh, surrounded by these broken red lines that make the shape of a circle. We have knowledge becoming more filtered or distilled or tailored to meet the user's needs as we go from primary research to knowledge synthesis and then to knowledge tools and products like CPGs, which stands for Clinical Practice Guidelines. The outer part of the circle is called the action part, and this is where we take information, identify problems and take information that we know to adapt to the local context, implement and monitor what happens. We move in and out of this action cycle ourselves in our research um, and CARD was actually developed with the Knowledge to Action framework as the guiding framework. I wanna thank at this time, my research collaborators who have been involved in many aspects of this work. Uh, a lot of them do come from the Help and Kids team. And here's a picture of us when we last got together to develop the recommendations for our 2015 guidelines. So thanks to them for their involvement in this research program. I also want to acknowledge partner organizations that work with us. The likelihood that we can make a real impact on practice is increased substantially by having the appropriate people involved and engaged to help us answer the relevant questions and to help us to disseminate and integrate the knowledge into practice. Uh, here's an outline, a brief outline of the presentation. I'll first review the rationale for why addressing vaccinations at, at school is important. Then I'll talk about how we developed CARD. I'll talk about the specific parts of CARD and then what we're learning so far are important influences on the success of CARD. So first, let's start with the rationale for addressing vaccinations at school. In general, there's no acknowledging needle pain or associated fear as part of school vaccinations. So here's a typical picture of a kid getting vaccinated at school. Where did I get this picture? Uh, you can probably guess from brochures promoting vaccination to the public. But actually, if we look further uh, at what the internet shows us about how students are experiencing vaccination at school, you'll see slightly different kinds of pictures. There is fear, there is anticipatory pain, uh, and importantly, it doesn't need to be this way. And in fact, inadequate pain management can lead to not only unnecessary pain, but also pain-related symptoms like fear, like dizziness, and occasionally fainting, which is a consequence or a further development of dizziness. How important are fear and pain? Well, our work in this area demonstrates that fear of needles is highly prevalent, but that interventions are not consistently implemented and concerns and negative experiences with vaccination impacts on people's willingness to be vaccinated. Here are the results from a large survey we conducted at the Ontario Science Center, where we looked at the prevalence of needle fears in kids and their parents. We talked to altogether about a thousand kids and a thousand parents about needles. And on the left, you can see the results for kids. So overall about two thirds of kids reported they're afraid of needles to varying degrees. So you see here uh, the percent of kids that say they're a little bit afraid, 33%. Uh, those that are moderately afraid, 14%. And very afraid, 16%. So altogether, this adds up to 63% or about two thirds of them. And then if you look on the right, you see how many parents are afraid. So about a quarter again to various degrees, and you can see by the color coding. There are at least two important points about these results. First, for the kids, 
being afraid of needles is common or normal. So this begs the question, then why isn't pain management normal or common? Next, for parents, these fears can continue, can continue into adulthood. So the majority of people acquire needle fears in childhood, somewhere between the age of four and eight. So for many of them, if we don't do anything to get rid of their fears, they won't go away. They'll just persist into adulthood. Now in another survey we carried out in schools across Canada, we discovered that less than 20% of kids are given any type of preparation about upcoming vaccinations at school. So any kind of education, not necessarily about coping. Only about half of kids could name any strategies to mitigate pain and fear. And only 20% of schools had items on hand to help kids with coping on vaccination day. So together, these results suggest that pain management practices are suboptimal. Concerns and negative experiences can affect an individual's willingness to be vaccinated, as I mentioned already. And this table shows you the results of a meta-analysis that we conducted uh, where students who were not vaccinated were asked for their reasons for not being vaccinated. And you can see from uh, the diamond at the bottom here, which is a combination of all the results of the individual studies or the overall meta-analytic value that about 20% or close to 20%, which is about one in five, kids actually states that concerns about pain or fear of needles impacted on their decision not to be vaccinated. As you may know, the World Health Organization named vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 threats to global health. Vaccine hesitancy involves delay or refusal of vaccines when they're available. In their original 3C model here, a vaccine hesitancy you can see the three domains that WHO named as being important. So one is complacency, another is confidence, and finally convenience. I'll just briefly talk a bit about them and how pain or fear of needles fits into this model. So firstly, complacency is about people's perceived risk of disease and uh, how easy it is that they think it will be for them to get treated if they do get the disease. So obviously, if they don't give a lot of importance to a disease or they think it's easy to treat it, if they get it, then they won't think getting vaccinated is as important. They may also have competing priorities to vaccination because everybody's busy and making time to go to the appointment may not be the most important thing. Next, confidence. This has to do with safety, your perceived safety of vaccines. So side effects. Pain is obviously a side effect, an unintended one uh, that goes with the way we give most vaccines, which is by injection, but also confidence has to do more broadly with trust in people who are delivering the vaccines and how well we think they care about us and we take care of us. And convenience has to do with structural and psychological barriers to vaccination. So things like how easy it is to get to the clinic uh, and that sort of thing. So Pain and fear, as I said, fit into at least two of these categories. They fit into confidence and they fit into convenience. Firstly, I mentioned that pain is a side effect of vaccination. So obviously it's going to be then a barrier to getting vaccinated if a healthcare provider, however, does effectively mitigate pain, they actually will reduce this barrier to patients or uh, individuals. So they'll not only show that they're competent, that is they're able to manage pain, but they'll also show through their act of treating pain that they care about patients. And this actually is important for building trusting relationships with patients. And then for convenience, uh, there are all kinds of factors fitting into how vaccines are delivered that may make it difficult for people to wanna to go. So for instance, uh, if you go to a pharmacy and there isn't, a lot, there isn't any privacy available and you want privacy, uh, if there isn't the ability to get pain management interventions or other convenient factors like this, then people are less likely to be vaccinated. So to help deal with pain and pain-related symptoms, including fear and dizziness or fainting, which in turn will hopefully and probably uh, reduce vaccine hesitancy, we created a clinical practice guideline. 
In this clinical practice guideline, which we published in 2015, we made recommendations about how to reduce pain, fear, and fainting across the lifespan. And the recommendations that we made were based on systematic reviews of the world literature. We categorized our recommendations into the five keys of pain management. The first four represent actual uh, categories of interventions you can use to reduce pain, fear, or fainting. So the what you can do. And then the fifth category is how we get everyone to do number one to number four above. So how do we educate, how do we communicate this information to all the relevant stakeholders? So just to briefly go through each of the what categories, procedural interventions have to do with what the immunizer can do to reduce pain, fear, or fainting. So it's about the injection technique. Physical interventions have to do with body position and activity. Pharmacological interventions are medicines that we use. And psychological interventions have to do with thoughts and behaviors. So clearly for numbers two to four, patients themselves or individuals can have a say for what they would choose to want to be interventions to help them cope with the procedure. And they can pick within categories of evidence-based interventions. So now let me talk a little bit more about how we integrated information from the guideline into the vaccine delivery process. Uh, that is how we delivered CARD. While our 2015 guideline gives recommendations about what can be done, it doesn't tell us how to do this for all possible vaccination contexts. Our clinical practice guideline provides some assistance or tools for providers like treatment algorithms, also has some pamphlets for patients, but it's difficult for practitioners who work in complex systems like the school vaccination program to be, be able to integrate all of this stuff consistently for all kids. And that's because they don't control all parts of the vaccination process. Now, selected authors of the clinical practice guideline partnered with uh, an individual public health unit, Niagara Region Public Health, who was interested in implementing the guideline. And we then worked on translating the guideline recommendations to the school vaccination program for Niagara's uh, health region con con uh, context. So we basically made the guideline actionable for Niagara Region. The project took a three-phased approach, and I'm gonna just briefly review the first part now. Uh, it involved talking to the relevant people who were involved in the vaccination program. So the students who are the recipients of the vaccines, uh, parents, teachers and school staff, and then public health nurses. So we wanted to find out what was happening and we wanted to identify opportunities for improvement. After talking to the different stakeholders, we created a diagram, which I'm showing you here, that identified the factors of the vaccination process that could lead to a negative vaccination experience. On the right here, you see depicted or named as chaos or negative experience. These were reviewed with staff and managers to look for opportunities to intervene. For instance, if you see here under family, if training or education was insufficient, then what could we do that could help to address this? And so we went through this uh, figure for all of the items and uh, looked for opportunities to change the way um, policies and procedures were carried out to be able to make it a more positive experience. We also undertook a benchmarking exercise, which you see the results of here. We documented what was already being done to manage pain, fear, and fainting. So the results show that for many interventions that could be used, they actually are not being used often. And just want to draw your attention to one. Uh, it's, it's distraction with an external object. So in our benchmarking exercise, only 3% of students had used this option to help them cope with the vaccination. So here we could be looking at ways to increase this. So can kids have other external devices available to help them cope with the procedure like cell phones? Can they use bubbles, fidget spinners, and other items? In the second and third phases of the project, we use the feedback to inform the creation of new policies and procedures, and we created CARD, 
That's what we named the new program or way of doing things. And we integrated CARD into the school vaccination, vaccination sorry, delivery process. And then we measured outcomes that were considered relevant and important to Niagara Region Public Health. So I'll briefly be reviewing some of the results of these steps. So first, we developed CARD after reviewing the current practices and finding ways to integrate uh, our guideline recommendations into their program of uh, vaccine delivery. So what is CARD exactly? It's a framework or a structure for incorporating interventions to make the vaccination process more enjoyable for students. And it covers or spans two different uh, time points or areas. Firstly, clinic planning activities, and secondly, clinic day activities. So we integrate interventions into both phases of the vaccine delivery process to try to improve the vaccination experience for kids or to reduce chaos. So as a result, CARD is actually a little bit broader than the clinical practice recommendations because it really strives to deliver vaccinations in a way that prioritize the, prioritizes the patient, so it's patient-focused. Uh, it just so happens that for kids getting vaccinated, concerns about pain and fear are predominant, so they make up a big part of CARD. CARD also happens to be a clever acronym for coping. Each letter of the word CARD stands for a different category of pain interventions. So C stands for comfort, A stands for ask questions, R stands for relax, and D stands for distract. All of the recommendations in our clinical practice guideline can fit into one of these four letters. So it's really the clinical practice guideline repackaged from the four P's of pain management to CARD, which makes it easy for people to remember. Individuals can choose to play any or all of their cards during vaccination. So let me show you what that looks like. Here are some examples of the way kids can play their cards. For each of these letters, I'm showing you a couple of coping interventions kids might choose. Um, note that this isn't an exhausted li exhaustive list. There are many more options available under each of the letter categories. And I'll just talk about the first one under each of the letter categories. Uh, for comfort, for instance, kids might choose to wear short sleeves, so it's easier to access their arm for the injection. Under ask, a student might ask if they can use a numbing cream uh, to reduce pain from the injection. For relax, a student might choose to bring a friend as a support person. And for distract, a student might want to talk to someone to be distracted, so either their friend if they brought their friend or the nurse. So there's choices, kids can play any uh, of their cards, they could play combinations of cards, there's really no wrong move. A card is consistent with accepted models of healthcare delivery that promote participation of individuals in their healthcare in partnership with and with support of healthcare team providers. So CARD, uh, in, a set, in essence, helps to operationalize person-centered care or client-centered care for the school vaccination context. And as I mentioned before, if we address pain, we build confidence in vaccinations. When we treat pain, we show we know how, and we also show that we care. And an important part of building a trusting relationship is that we demonstrate competence as well as caring. We often focus in uh, healthcare training on competence or technical expertise and forego caring, but if we don't demonstrate caring as well, then we won't be trusted by patients. So next I want to review the components of the CARD framework in more detail. It's important to acknowledge up front that CARD can't happen without the involvement of leadership as planning is needed to be able to integrate CARD into usual vaccination activities. So this might involve changing uh, policies and procedures. This also includes consultations to review and adapt tools 
and processes to organize and deliver staff training and then to be able to support staff as they integrate CARD into their work. There are several template tools that have been developed for training and implementation purposes targeted to the different groups who are involved. So this includes uh, public health staff, this includes students, parents, and school staff. And they come in the form of videos, pamphlets, PowerPoint presentations, and some of those are here shown on this slide. There are also template checklists that integrate CARD into usual vaccination activities and sample scripts that can be used by public health staff involved in the vaccination program to have conversations with students or to have conversations with school staff about CARD. These can be customized to suit the context or the setting where CARD is being implemented. We also created a checklist to make it easy to track compliance at a glance with the different steps of CARD. This table gives a high level view of the key phases and activities associated with CARD that the resources I just showed you fit into. So I said CARD involved making some changes to two phases or two parts of the vaccination process. So this involves, this includes preparation or planning and vaccination day. Here on this table, you could see some of those key activities or the main activities that um, are part of those two different steps. And I'm gonna talk about them a little bit. The first part of clinic planning is meeting with school staff, usually the principal to confirm a clinic date and to review what will be needed to ensure a safe and smooth clinic. So one of these requests is an adequate clinic space. I'm showing you here a picture of the library. Libraries are often the ideal setting for vaccination clinics. And this is because they have big tables. So there's a lot of room for nurses to put all of their equipment, which usually includes not only the needles and vaccines, but waste containers, laptops. Also tables can be spaced apart so students aren't close to one another. And they, the library can be sealed off so that there isn't uh, traffic coming in and out, but it can be limited to only people involved with the clinic. Now, other asks that uh, public health staff may have during these principal meetings are for the provision of a private space for kids that want privacy and the ability for students to use electronic devices such as their cell phones as distraction agents. Next, public health staff send reminders to schools of the clinic day ahead of time and confirm the spaces that are required. They also ask schools to send reminders to families and to students as well as to school staff. And this reduces the chance that on clinic day, uh, everyone's surprised that the nurses are there and they haven't made the preparations or uh, made the space available for the clinic. Next, students are educated about vaccination and CARD. We have two videos that are used for this purpose. So they, the first one reviews what a vaccine is and why it's needed. And the second one reviews how to play your cards to help with coping. These videos can be shown to students in the classroom by public health staff when they're in the school distributing their vaccine consents. And some public health units like Niagara Region also had dedicated time or allocated time to teach kids about vaccination. So they then uh, incorporated this information, this training within that time that they already had. Nurses can take the opportunity as well to provide specific information to students during the teaching that is uh, pertinent to them, such as what room will be used in their particular school and what coping strategies they're allowed to use, like whether they're allowed to bring their own cell phones. And at the education, uh, students are also provided with a card pamphlet where they can record their preferred uh, coping strategies for the upcoming clinic. The pamphlet is a companion to the card video where they learn about coping. It reminds them of the acronym, so what CARD stands for on the first page. And the second page shows them some examples of the individual interventions or strategies that they can choose from under each of the letter categories. So what they do is they, they fill in the blanks with, the, with what they want for their vaccinations. Nurses can then 
scan these and identify any interventions that uh, require planning and make sure that they plan ahead of time. So for instance, topical anesthetics. And these pamphlets can be kept by the kids or the homeroom teacher for future access and future review. So here's an example of a completed card pamphlet. You can see that the student uh, wants to bring their friend, so they ask if they can bring their friend. They want their friend to help them to relax, and they want to talk to their friend as a distraction. They also mention that they're going to bring a snack to eat. Then on clinic day, the environment is prepared to minimize visual cues that elicit fear. So for example, workstations are set up so kids don't need to face equipment or other kids. Here you can see that the chair uh, at this workstation for the student is faced outwards. So the student cannot see other students behind in other workstations as well. They can't really see the equipment that the nurse is using. Workstations are generally spread apart, not so much here, but in general they would be uh, more so than this. Table dividers like this one are placed on the table to obscure equipment such as the needles that might be on the other side as the nurse is preparing for the injections. This particular table poster also serves as a distraction and a cue for kids to play their cards. The dividers are not so big so that if a student wants to peek behind them, they can. But if they don't want to, then they, they really can't really. So they have to make an effort to look behind the barrier. Next, the nurses visit the students in their classrooms before the clinic begins to introduce themselves, to review the clinic processes and remind students of CARD. Students can also let nurses know at this time of any changes they want to make to any coping strategies that they want to use. So changes that they want to make to their card pamphlet. And then the students are brought down for vaccination according to their level of fear and special requests. The most fearful students go first. Uh, kids wait outside of the clinic area in a separate waiting area and in small numbers. So not entire classes are brought at the same time. There can be kids uh, that want to be vaccinated in private as well as those that want to be vaccinated in the main clinic space sitting in the same waiting area. Now here you see a picture of a private office that happens to be part of a library that might be the private space that's used if kids require privacy. And finally, students play their cards during vaccination. And as part of this process, nurses assess the level of fear kids have, and then they ask them what cards they want to play. Nurses will coach kids according to their preferred coping strategies as required. Um, I now actually want to show you a couple of videos that demonstrate how nurses communicate with the kids about CARD, because nurses uh, did have to develop or did have to create uh, a language and a way of talking to kids and they did do that as part of our development of card and I want to show you how kids can play their cards differently. So here's the first one. Let's hope that the video works okay. okay so some kids are nervous about are nervous about getting vaccines and others are not. On a scale of zero to three, zero being not scared at all or three being really nervous, how are you feeling? Uh, zero. Zero. Great. What card are you going to be playing today? Distraction. Okay, and what did you bring for that? My phone. Oh, excellent. Are you going to play a game or listen to some music? Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to get some things ready here. Relax your arm and I can help you with that. Again, yeah, we want to make it like loose like spaghetti. All done. How was that? Good. It is fantastic. I'll give you a band-aid. So you can see in this case that um, the child was not actually fearful, but the card uh, with card you don't need to be afraid. In fact, the level of fear is not really the determining factor in playing one's cards. It has more to do with giving kids choices that they can make to have a positive experience. So as I said before, card is more than just about pain or fear. It's about having students participant in their healthcare and choosing how to make it more enjoyable for them. 
I'm going to show you another case now, a little bit different, and you'll notice this kid has a higher fear level, and um, as I said, is going to be picking different interventions in the first child. Some kids get really nervous with vaccines, and some kids aren't nervous at all. Let's say we had a scale of zero to three. Zero is going to be the lowest. Where would you say you are on that scale? So that's pretty high. So you remember the card system that Kelly just went over with you as well. What kind of card are you going to play today that's going to help you with that? Relax and distract. Nice. What kind of things are you going to do to relax? Deep breathing. Right. Can you show me how you do that? Perfect. And what about distraction? Squishy. Squishy. And I see you've brought a buddy with you too. If the student brings their friend, ask the friend how they're going to help. So, you know what else can really help? If your buddy blows bubbles. Do you like bubbles? Yeah. Bubbles can be fun. So I'm gonna have your buddy, what's your buddy's name? Brooke. Brooke, hi Brooke. Do you think you can blow some bubbles while I get things ready here? Deep breath, blow. You're doing extremely well. One more honey and then you're done. Good job. You're completely done, what do you think? You did really, really well, and thanks, Brooke, for helping out. So you can see here in both cases, actually, how the nurse assisted the student and coached them throughout the procedure. And the students, in turn, were clearly knowledgeable. They came prepared for the procedure, and they could follow what the nurse was saying. After selecting and tailoring the CART system for Niagara Region Public Health, we tested it in a small implementation project. We used a control clinical trial design and we implemented CART in five schools and we compared it to five match schools where we provided standard care. We collected data during two different vaccine visits in grade seven students. So in Ontario, you may know that um, Public Health provides vaccinations at school in grade seven. So there were two visits, which we call round one and round two for the grade seven students, and two separate visits were needed because some of the vaccines require two doses for full immunity. So nurses have to visit the school twice. Round one clinics take, round one clinics take place in the fall, and then round two take place in the spring. And what we did was we collected data about student symptoms, use of coping interventions, and then we compared those between groups. And we also conducted focus group interviews to obtain information about people's perceptions about CARD. This slide shows the student symptoms for CARD and control groups. Students reported their fear, dizziness, and pain scores on a numerical rating scale that ranged from zero to 10 but then we dichotomize these scores into high and low based on a cutoff of six. So if you had a score that was greater than six for fear, dizziness, or pain, it was recorded as high. And what you are seeing on this slide is the percent of kids that reported high fear, high dizziness, and high pain for round one and round two. We, we obtained overall, looking at round one and round two, significantly lower uh, fear scores or lower percentage of kids with high fear in the card group compared to control and as well for dizziness. So significantly fewer kids in the card group had high levels of dizziness. Uh, interestingly though, there was no difference in pain. The percent of kids that had high levels of pain was similar and that may have to do with the fact that um, really the injections themselves are not that painful. But the kids are more symptomatic with respect to their perceptions of how painful it would be and their overall fear of the event. There was positive feedback from the different stakeholder groups, including all of them, students, school staff, nurses, and parents. Uh, they, were positive, they were positive towards the program, conveying sentiments re related to acceptability and compatibility of CARD. Here are some of the comments that people made. Uh, nurses said this was just building on their skills. Everything was just more planned or strategic. Students were prepared, confident, empowered. Uh, they actually managed to make it fun. This made the job better for nurses because kids were less stressed, so they were less stressed. And uh, one principal just said, uh, I don't know why you would go back. 
Now in the last part of the presentation, I want to talk a bit about some of the factors that so far we've identified as contributing positively to the success of uh, CARD and also negatively to uh, implementation success. So here are some of the factors that we found that can positively influence implementation success. First, the culture of the organization. Is it one of continuous quality improvement? Are there individuals that take charge of the implementation and work to develop and support it? There has to be ongoing communication and collaboration of all the project members, including staff at different levels. This ensures that any concerns or any issues that come up are being addressed and that there's engagement and input from everyone. Of course, strong external partnerships can make a big difference too. If a school and staff are supportive, they can reinforce messages, they can support the nurses rather than contributing to the chaos. So for instance, they would you know, willingly provide a private room, they provide the library, they'll allow children to use their electronic devices rather than um, doing things that are counterintuitive and things that might actually increase distress. CARD itself is intuitive for nurses. Nurses already try to incorporate some of the interventions into their usual practice, but what CARD does is it provides a framework at an organizational level. It makes this happen more systematically, more equitably, so that all children can benefit. This takes the burden off of individual nurses or staff from having to try to figure this all out themselves and it rewards or validates their attempts to provide better pain care or more patient-centered care. We also found that checking in with everyone is helpful to see that people's impressions of the effect can be confirmed and also to get any feedback about additional improvements that we can make. So this is something that was new to Niagara region, not part of the usual practice. That is, in our project, we did this with surveys and focus groups which included documenting student symptoms and use of coping interventions and asking people about their experiences. There are also some challenges, of course, to implementation. And as we use CARD more and try it out in different places, we can see how um, things can run differently and this can have an impact. As I said, leadership support is critical. Also providing allocated resources uh, are important especially in the beginning because you have to plan for the implementation uh, and you have to plan to train the staff and a lot of the work with card is really upfront in the sense that it, it involves the planning or preparation phase so if you don't already educate students about vaccination then that's kind of adding a step to uh, what you're doing now so this may take some time not all people will buy in and there needs to be good communication to work with everyone so they can see how current is aligned with their professional roles or with the mission and the values of the public health system as most institutions are practicing with the goal of providing person-centered care. Reducing pain and fear also reduces staff stress which improves their satisfaction. Um, one thing that we have also noticed is, noticed is that uh, people would need to try this out or it's probably better if they try it out on a small scale, try to tweak it before implementing in a large way. So they can try different parts of CARD so as not to overwhelm staff or to implement it in a small number of schools, work out all the bugs, get an idea of how much time is needed and what re resources might be needed. It's a great opportunity also for public health to work with schools and build relationships with them. So even if the relationships are not strong to begin with, which can pose as a barrier, the, there is actually via card an opportunity to build relationships with the school. So you have a reason to reach out to the school, to have to talk to the school and the staff. And when we show them that we care about the kids, they're usually uh, willing to help. So in general, schools are supportive of any effort that we make to educate kids, to empower kids, to involve kids in their healthcare. And to help facilitate this process, we have made scripts, which I mentioned before, and other tools that uh, public health can use when they interact 
with uh, schools, so with different groups, and we are continuing to do that to make uh, them feel more comfortable, particularly, excuse me, when it's something that they don't routinely do, so it's not part of their usual activities. This is also a great way to expand the value or the perceived value of public health staff and their role, so they're not just looked on as uh, people who are delivering vaccinations, who are causing chaos to the school, but actually as people who are also teaching skills to their students. And pain and fear are, are also related to general, um, I should say priorities to address mental health issues. So when nurses are teaching about coping, they are also supporting efforts to promote mental health and to promote resilience. And this is aligned with um, the goals of schools or educational goals for kids. Uh, now at present, we're continuing to customize CARD for different regions. So we've gone beyond Niagara and we're now trialing it out in other public health contexts. Uh, so we're using it in kids with different grades and in other public health units that deliver vaccinations in slightly different ways, which might include different staff and different staff roles. roles. So we're building additional resources to help roll out CARD in different contexts to make it easier for people to get started to use it. Uh, you probably appreciate that uh, by now it's not really limited to school vaccinations as I said uh, at the beginning it really can be a framework for how to approach person-centered care more broadly so including different clinical settings in fact we've modified it for use as a tool to cope with COVID related fear and anxiety the framework is the same the only thing that changes are the options under each of the letter categories and in other research projects, we plan to evaluate it uh, for dental visits or dental clinics, um, as well as for hospital visits where medical procedures are involved. So I've come to the end of my presentation. I wanna summarize just by saying that CARD's a new framework for delivering vaccinations at school that improves the vaccination experience for kids um, and also for others, including public health nurses, school staff, and parents. I just wanna leave you to think about how you can incorporate the principles of CARD in your practice or for your next vaccination. And uh, I'll stop here. I think there's a little bit of time for me to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for that informative presentation on CARD. Um, definitely, it's a great tool for minimizing needle fear and uh, anxiety in school immunizations. At this point, uh, please go ahead and submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, you can also submit your questions anonymously. Uh, any questions that are answered live will appear in your Q&A window under the All Questions tab. Please also note that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all attendees. Uh, after the presentation, presentation slides will also be shared and both will be available on uh, our website. Uh, now then I see that we have a couple questions. Uh, so, Anna, the first one is, um, thank you for the presentation, very interesting project. Can you explain to what extent uh, does the CAR tool increase vaccine acceptance? And also, were there any resistance from the staff, uh, I believe nursing staff, as it was more work for them? Okay, so great question. So uh, we're beginning to look at acceptance. So when we de developed CARD and the information we have up to date with uh, Niagara, we didn't do a big enough project to be able to look at acceptance. We expect that um, there might be a positive effect on acceptance, but that this might actually not be visible right away. So it might be that over time, as people see that we're starting to do these things and we're caring about the kids, you know, the rumor will get out and the grade seven, which becomes the grade eight class, is then going to have a great experience and the grade sevens are going to hear about this, they're going to talk about this, they're going to talk about it at home, and it'll make people be more positive. So in the short term, and certainly with the scope of the Niagara project, we didn't have a big enough sample size or a long enough time span or time horizon to look at acceptance. 
but we're trying to do that in future studies. Um, I think there was another question about um, did the nurses think it took longer to do CARD? We actually did track this in our Niagara project, and there was a little bit more time involved in the beginning. Uh, for Niagara, however, they already have an infrastructure and um, time allocated to teaching kids at school. So what they did was they, they took up a period of students uh, class, which is about 40 minutes, I think, to uh, teach about vaccinations. And instead of teaching just about the, the diseases, they added this information about CARD. So it didn't really add in that sense, but where CARD added a bit of time was negotiating the space with the principal. So they talked to the principals a lot more than they did before. Um, during the actual clinics though, um, not really demonstrated to increase time. So it's a little bit more time prepping uh, ahead of time. And on the day of the vaccine, it actually can save time. So from the point of view of our experience with Niagara, there were no additional um, FTEs required after they implemented CARD. And after doing the pilot, they did actually implement it across the entire school program. And they did not have to increase their complement of staff to be able to do so. Okay. Um, also, could you explain uh, briefly how the schools were selected in the initial pilot? Yeah. So fortunately for us, um, Niagara Region has a good relationship with the school boards and we actually um, met with the superintendent of the school board that we chose to participate in the study or that we asked to participate in the study and they worked with us to identify the schools so they had some schools that were participating in other projects other research projects so they sort of handpicked the um, schools that would be available to particip participate in our project and um, match them so match them on demographic characteristics size of school this sort of stuff so that's how we did that um, does that answer the question it, i mean if it doesn't please do ask me further in the q a to elaborate but it was with the help of the superintendent of the school board that we selected the schools okay, okay. um also uh, another question uh, this project uh, it's great uh, well have you considered uh, having discussions for this becoming a policy across all public house units in Ontario. And I'll just add another point is for any public house units who are interested in implementing CARD, what step do they have to take to introduce this in their programs? Yeah, so to your first point, uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health in uh, a report of um, the modernization of immunization, you may know, did pick as a priority managing pain or reducing pain during vaccination. So it, it's sort of a recognized activity that people should be undertaking. Uh, it is part of the vaccination pro process, trying to mitigate the harms and pain as a harm. So I'd say generally speaking, uh, public health units are, uh, I'm sure, engaged in ways to try to make this a more pleasant experience. And they're not required, obviously, to implement CARD specifically. And uh, as I said during the presentation, a lot of the stuff that's in CARD actually are things that people do anyway. This is, this is intuitive for nurses, it's part of their practice, but what CARD does is gives it a structure and um, allows it to happen more systematically and more equitably. If people do want to use CARD specifically, I would say please contact me so that we can share our resources with you uh, coach you and then if you want to collect any data we can share our data collection tools and uh, help you to collect that data collate that data so that you can feed back to the staff feed back to the schools feed back to the families the kids um, what you're doing to make this a better procedure for them okay uh, as a follow-up on that then uh, there's a little bit of echo i apologize everyone uh, what would be the best way to contact you anna uh, probably a routine people can direct questions to you and you can send them to me or they can email me directly and I think my first slide might have had my email on it it's Anna a n n a dot t a d d i o at utoronto.ca 
Okay, we'll go ahead and share that with everyone uh, post-webinar then. Uh, we have now another question. Are you planning to test the CART system against the virtual reality painless injections? Okay, so uh, I'm not clear on the question. Is virtual reality an intervention to help make it less painful? Is that what you're referring to? So as a, a way to help kids cope? I believe so. I think that is, uh, yes. Okay, okay, sounds like yeah. So I see virtual reality as just being one of the options under the distraction category of CARD. So it's already built in CARD. CARD is not prescriptive in terms of what's included in each of the letter categories. And for different contexts, people can make different option sheets. So the pamphlet that I showed during my presentation had a number of options under the letter categories that uh, we decided we would include. And, they ha and the, that was limited or included um, to the point of all the things that we could guarantee that we could give kids. But in your setting, you know, if you can have virtual reality be something that's available or some other interventions like pets or, you know, whatever it is, that certainly can become part of CARD. Uh, but I don't see it as something that needs to be evaluated on its own. We already know distractions work and uh, people can choose the distractions that they think will work best for them. Okay. No, that helps uh, definitely clarify the two comparisons. Uh, we have a comment here that cards is uh, certainly a more economic uh, tool and easy to apply. So thank you for introducing us to this wonderful tool. Uh, it looks like we're almost to the end of our webinar, about two o'clock. So if anybody does have uh, more questions for Anna, please uh, contact us on CAMVAC. We will be happy to share those questions with Anna. And so thank you everyone for joining us on our webinar today. And especially a thank you again to Dr. Tadio for your presentation on the CAR system. I hope that this tool will be helpful to all um, in minimizing needle fear, pain, and fainting dual school vaccinations. And we look forward to learning more about the other settings and other contexts this can be applicable in. Um, as a quick reminder, Please take the time to fill out the survey upon closing of the webinar window. Uh, we look forward to your feedback and suggestions. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon and stay safe.